okay so hello everyone uh, in today's class we begin with chapter 7 which is uh, stresses due to bending and uh, I mean we have seen the stresses due to axial loading we have seen the stresses due to stresses and uh, strains due to uh, twisting and now we move to stresses due to bending the next chapter will be deformations due to bending okay so by the end of it all we would have learned about the three major loadings and what is the stress and strain they cause in a solid body at any point in the solid body okay so that's what we would be learning now so the idea of a beam is very simple when a slender member this is from the first line from your textbook We say it acts as a beam. When a slender member is subjected to transverse loading, we say it acts as a beam. And we can find many such examples. Okay. So if you look at the construction of a building, then there are these horizontal members. Okay. Like when the building would have uh, horizontal members as well. So they will be under bending because they would have a load in this particular form okay and <laughs> we had also seen how a dam like if you had a say this is a dam and then the water is held at this high the outlet is somewhere over here so on this side you have this edge sort of a situation so the pressure which will act on this will be minimum over here here it would be atmospheric pressure but it will gradually keep on increasing to this value of p naught plus rho g h so if you invert this you would see this as a cantilever beam in which the loading is like this so there is a transverse loading acting and attack so it's not a beam only which acts like a beam it is also say like a dam like this which can also be visualized as a beam so the idea and there are several other examples in your textbook which you should read and if you do not know what they mean you should use your internet to exactly understand what they are for example the leaf springs of an automobile suspension transfer and the body weight to the axle through beam action so this is something which you should know the wings of an airplane act as a beams in supporting the weight of the fuselage so you have to see all these things and visualize how a beam is acting the loads are acting on a beam okay in the third chapter we had found out that we if you section a transversely loaded member as is shown in figure 7.1 section in the sense you hypothetically make a cut in the um, member which is shown i mean example of it is shown in 7.1 a shear force and a bending moment would in general have the have to act in order on the cross section in order to maintain equilibrium so you see you have a shear force and a bending moment which is acting and we have taken an arbitrarily shaped uh, slender member okay so this is a L shaped rod, approximately L shaped rod. And then you have the bend shear force and the bending moment acting. So this was required to maintain equilibrium. If you do not, do not recall it, now is a good time to actually confirm this statement that why do you need both of them? Okay. So 
so in this particular chapter we would want to determine the distribution of stresses which have shear force and bending moment as their resultant okay so you want to find these stresses at these points the resultant of which will give, give you the shear force and the bending moment so i mean the say the stress at this particular point although we shall for necessity consider the nature of deformation of beams we shall postpone until chapter 8 a detailed discussion of the deflection so we will not study about deflection so in all the other chapters which we have learned thus far i mean the stresses and strain were both easier to find out and they could be studied in one chapter like axial like twisting but for bending you require a very detailed analysis of stresses and then an equally detailed analysis about the uh, strains okay so we'll do that later on in chapter 8 so our method of approach will be similar to that followed in the investigation of torsion in chapter 6 uh, the previous chapter and uh, we'll be again using this method 2.1 uh, which we have been using from the start of the course as such and the same would be taken care of in this method okay so let's start with the section 7.2 which is the geometry of deformation of a symmetric beam subjected to pure bending okay so we begin by considering an originally straight beam uh, which is uniform along its length this is the beam which we are referring to it is originally straight and it is uniform along its length so there is no non uniformity anywhere and whose cross section is symmetrical about the plane of loading so the plane of loading is we, we will see what those planes of loading are but the uh, cross section is symmetrical about this plane of loading as shown in figure 7.2 and whose material properties are constant along the length of the beam and symmetrical with respect to the plane of loading okay so we further restrict our immediate attention to the case where such a beam transmits a bending moment which is constant along its length so this is constant along the length this is a specialized case so b is a specialized case of a okay in general you are aware that the bending moment and the shear force will act and it will also vary with the length so this will be a function of x this will be also be a function of x we have seen that like right? when we um, Uh, in chapter 3 we have seen that we drew the shear force and bending moment diagram so the very fact that we could draw it meant that uh, the shear force and the bending moment vary across the length of this okay in this chapter we restrict a case we restrict our study to this case in which a bending in which the beam transmits a in which a beam transmits uh, a bending moment which is constant along its length so this is constant so over here mb of sorry mb of x is constant okay okay so this case is called pure bending so you have already seen what a pure shear pure shear was in i think chapter 4 or 5 perhaps chapter 5 now you know what pure bending is a beam which transmits a constant bending moment is said to be in pure bending we select this simple case as a starting point because as will become evident there is sufficient symmetry in this situation so that the deformation pattern can be fixed by symmetry arguments alone so symmetry will again play a role in the arguments like it had played role in chapter 6 so we'll have to take note of those arguments over there after establishing the nature of the deformation we shall introduce the stress strain relations and then complete the three steps 2.1 which we have been following 
and they would require that the resulting stress distribution have the resultant MB which is required for equilibrium of the beam as a whole. So we'll see that in action soon. <coughs> okay, let's now take this uh, case. Let me just zoom it. Okay. So since our originally straight beam will deform into some curved shape, okay, I mean just to draw a simple beam, this is say a cantilever beam and under the action of loading, it will take up some curved shape like this. Okay, we don't know what, but it will take some curve. So we, we should define something called a curvature now. Okay. And let's see that idea. The curvature of a plane, the curvature of a plane curve is defined as the rate of change of the slope angle of the curve with respect to the distance along the curve. So if you look at figure 7.3, we illustrate a curve AD. Okay. I mean, we are not taking a circular curve because that would make everything very easy and we don't know that the beam will actually take a circular curve most of the time it doesn't so we are defining it for a general curvature okay so figure 7.3 we illustrate a curve AD whose curvature is in the XY plane so AD is the curve XY plane is what you have and the normals to the curve at B and C intersect in the point O dash so if you draw a normal to the curve at B then normal to the curve at C, they intersect at this point O dash. Okay. So I mean if you draw a tangent at B, it will be like this. So it's a 90 degree and this seems to be a tangent drawn. So they will intersect at point O dash. Now let me just write what the curvature was. Curvature of a plane curve. Okay, by taking it in the XY plane, we have ensured it's a plane curve. So curvature of a plane curve defines the rate of change of the slope angle of the curve with respect to the distance along the curve. So let's first find the change in slope angle between B and C. So if that angle is delta phi, okay. So between, let's see how we can define this, okay. So if this particular angle is delta phi, and the change in slope between B and C is delta phi. When delta phi is small, the arc delta S, this is the arc delta S, that can be approximated as uh, O dash P delta phi. Okay. This is how you can uh, take this along the curve. Okay. And let's see how this delta phi has come along first. So at B you draw a line which is x-axis or parallel to the x-axis. Okay. Phi is the slope of this line with respect to the x-axis. I mean this is tangent as you see. Okay. Now this point B and this point C this line C which you see passing this tangent is at an angle of a phi plus delta phi from the x-axis. Okay, So the slope has changed by a value equal to delta phi. Okay? 
that's the first part of it now let's draw i mean how do you find that this angle is also delta phi one easy way to see if the normals have a slope of delta phi between them like this normal sorry this tangent and this tangent has a slope of delta phi between them and the angle delta phi between them the normals will also have a slope of delta phi i mean the angle delta phi between them because eventually both of the them are separated by 90 degrees to their normals okay so that's one easy way then now at this time you should find another way to find that this angle is equal to delta phi you must use certain geometries which you can think of and then convince yourself that this is actually equal to delta phi okay so you should do that by geometry and convince yourself that you will get this angle as delta phi okay now when delta phi is small the the curvature can be written as this delta s is equal to o dash b delta phi we knew that now if c approaches b so limiting case as a now that would mean that delta s is tending to zero right because delta s was actually the separation between c and b so c minus b will tend to zero this would mean that delta s would tend to zero remember this delta s is along the curve and that is very important this is along the curve now the curvature at point B, so B was your reference point, okay, because it was at angle phi, slope was phi. So, at in the limiting case, you will have a d phi by ds is equal to limit delta s tending to zero, delta phi by delta s. This is equal to limit of delta s tending to zero, one by o dash b, and this is equal to one by rho. So, rho equal to a o b is the radius of curvature at b. Okay. Now you can see that I have very cleverly written O dash B as O B. Okay. I mean according to this diagram, O dash is the intersection point. But this is the case. In the case when delta phi is tending to zero, okay, or let me say delta S is tending to zero. Delta S is tending to zero. O dash B will tend to OB or the point O will tend to O, O dash will tend to O. So delta in the case delta S tends to degree, this point O dash will be tending to O and that is why you can write rho is equal to OB is the radius of curvature of at point P. Okay, so that's how we have defined uh, the radius of curvature and this is extremely important in uh, our uh, use of stress and strains in beam so it is very important to be clear about the curvature the concept of curvature at this point okay let's now move ahead so we are always taking a beam in this shape okay so that i mean we don't generalize we don't specialize for a case in which the beam is a, say a rectangular or some other geometry. The only thing is it must be symmetric. Okay. So that is something which we can see. And in this case, this x, y is the plane of symmetry. It also happens to be the plane of loading. Okay. 
so this is where so it has to be symmetric the origin has to be such that the coordinate system has to place such that the area is symmetric about this plane okay and there are certain other definitions which we will come across but this is the whole idea so it can be any shape it can be circular it can be square it can be any other shape but it must be symmetric and so this is what we require for our analysis below okay so let's yeah so we turn now as the author in the textbook says we turn now uh, to the geometry of deformation of pure bending i am writing pure bending at the start just so that we get used to this and then i will stop writing it okay we now turn to the geometry of deformation of pure bending in figure 7.4a this is 7.4a this is how the area looks like the cross sectional area and this what you see is actually the front view side view depending on where you are seeing it from okay so you have a d b e and c f represent three equidistant plane sections so a d is a plane b e is a plane and c f is a plane on this do remember that they are plane sections they are not lines so they are like planes like this this can be say ad then you can have pe and then similarly cf they are all equidistant and uh, parallel to each other so that's what we have <coughs> okay okay three equidistant plane sections so they are equal from each other and clearly parallel parallel uh, all perpendicular to the axis of in initially straight beam so the axis will be of this initially straight beam will be like this and in the undeformed situation they are all perpendicular these planes are all undeformed uh, are, are uh, perpendicular to this axis okay all perpendicular to the axis of an initially straight beam now in figure 7.4b in this particular figure we show the beam bent by bending moment so we know that if there is a bending happening there is a curved deformation which is happening and mb is applied at the ends of the plane of symmetry so you see this bending moment which is applied uh, to cause this okay now what has changed over here a lot so if because of the curvature of this uh, beam the new points this point a actually it's a plane okay but in this view which you are seeing you will see this plane as a line so a becomes a1 d becomes d1 b becomes b1 e becomes e1 and so on so you now have these new uh, i mean the displaced points and uh, you because it's a curvature they are all intersecting at this point uh, o okay so that's the first part of it and there is a reason why we have taken this delta phi same because about be both of them are equidistant and since both of them are experiencing the same, both sides are experiencing the same bending moment there would be a symmetry in their deformation so they would have make the same angle delta phi okay so that's the first part of it now in 7.4c the two deformed elements formed by the surfaces a1 d1 so what we have done is we have taken this out okay and we have taken this out so show the two deformed elements formed by the surfaces a1 d1 b1 e1 and c1 f1 so these two surfaces are separately shown 
Now each element is loaded in its plane of symmetry. We can argue that the deformation of each will be symmetrical about its plane of symmetry. Okay. Because each element is loaded in its plane of symmetry, we can argue that the deformation of each will be symmetrical about its plane of symmetry. Further, since their undeformed shape, these elements were identical and since they are subjected to identical bending moments, it is reasonable to suppose at least when they are far away from the ends, that is always there, that their deformed shapes will be identical. Okay. So if for instance, so this, you please see that this is not what we are claiming that this will happen. We are going through a thought process in which this should happen. Okay. So if for instance, the surface A1, D1 of element A1, D1, E1, B1, this element bulged out. Okay. If this surface bulged out, we would expect the corresponding surface B1, E1 of the element B1, E1, F1, C1 to bulge out. This would also bulge out okay, by the same amount. However, the latter action requires the surface B1, E1 of element a1, D1, B1, E1 to be dished in. This would this would require this to happen dish in like this, and this would destroy the end-to-end -end symmetry. Okay, meaning your A1, D1. If this is like this, then this would also have to be like this. And if the next one B1, C1 is like this then it will also have to be like this. So this is a similar argument which we used in torsion. Okay, so I'll repeat this once more. If for instance, I mean this is what we are thinking about. If the surface, I'll drop this. If the surface A1, D1 of this element bulged out like this, okay, we would expect the corresponding surface B1, E1 of this element to also bulge out like this, right? Uh, because they have to behave in a similar way. And, okay. Now, this would mean that this edge B1, E1 of this element must bulge in, okay? And this would de destroy the end-to-end -end symmetry of your problem. Okay, so this cannot happen because this must actually be like this because of the symmetry in this loading. So this is where the beauty of symmetry argument lies and through this we are able to say a lot. Okay, this destroys the end-to-end -end symmetry of the deformation which this, this element must, must possess and we conclude therefore that the surfaces a1 d1 b1 e1 and c1 f1 must be plane surfaces perpendicular to the plane of symmetry so they must be even in the deformed state they must be perpendicular to the plane of symmetry so this is the plane of symmetry this is the plane of symmetry remember this sorry So the plane of symmetry was this as is shown over here okay and this surfaces were like this so they were in fact perpendicular so this was a plane of symmetry forming 90 degree and even in the deformed configuration they will continue to be like this okay so How it is. Okay. So this is how you would have the plane of symmetry. Okay. 
so in pure bending in a plane of symmetry plane cross sections remain plane plane cross sections remain plane okay let's so this is how we know that these uh, planes haven't actually curved so that is why you show them by the straight line a1 b1 b1 e1 and c1 e1 okay furthermore the fact that each element deforms identically means that the initially parallel plane sections must now have a common intersection as illustrated by point o in figure 7.4 b the fact that each element deforms identically okay means that the initially parallel plane sections now must have a common intersection as illustrated by point o okay now this is the whole thing since each of them have to deform each element i mean element 1 element 2 have to deform identically that means that whatever change has happened to ad as a1 d1 the same change should have happened to cf as c1 f1 okay so whatever tilt has happened whatever extension or compression has happened has to happen the exactly the same way okay because i uh, each element has to identically deform and that is why they will have this common point of intersection and that's why this delta pi angle was shown earlier now the beam bends into the arc of a circle centered on this intersection so because this angle is delta phi this will actually be the arc of a circle because this can only happen in a circle or arc of a circle the angle remains the same okay so this is one conclusion which we have made so the beam bends why is this happening in pure bending because mb is the same right if there were different mb is acting on this element and different mb is acting on this element then you would have the answer very different and one of the things which we have not done i mean we never said that ad i mean the separation between this and these planes is small the separation can be finite as long as they are away from the boundary but they don't have to be small and so the in the most general case the bending moment can vary along x but since we refer to this plane uh, pure bending problem the mv is same on the edges of this and over here as well so that's why you have the same mv and that is why we are able to apply these symmetry arguments the way we are applying so by claiming that that they must identically deform and so on okay so beam bends into the arc of a circle centered on this intersection okay now it should be noted that the above arguments have not ruled out the possibility of deformation of a plane section within its own plane so if there is a plane section like ad well we know that it will remain a plane okay so it won't curve so that's why we show it by a1 d1 but there is no uh, reason for us to believe that there will not be any deformation in this plane section on its own plane okay so this can happen i mean if ad was your plane like this okay well it must be remain a plane so something like this can definitely happen okay so 
the dimensions can change as long as they remain in the same plane. So the, I mean, it's the out of plane deformation is something which we cannot consider, but this is something which we have to allow. So such deformation does in fact occur. The only restriction on it being that it must be symmetrical with respect to the plane of symmetry. So note again the plane of symmetry, it will pass through like this. Okay. So this is your A. What I am doing is this plane AD, I am trying to show A, A dash. So A dash is essentially the one which is behind it, the point behind. Similarly, D, D dash. And when you see this, you are actually seeing it from this eye. The eye is over here. This dashed is your plane of symmetry. And similar remains your plane of symmetry over here. So for example, this has now become A1, A1 dash and D1 to D1 dash. So this can happen as long as the deformation is symmetrical with respect to the plane of symmetry, which is this dashed line over here. So I hope you are able to clearly see how we are changing our view of the beam and its deformation. So your earlier courses in technical engineering of drawing or whatever else you were doing should be helpful in this part. Please don't ignore all these visualizations. Okay, we now pursue further the geometry of deformation in order to obtain the distribution of strain which is implied in our condition. So let's see. Okay, in figure 7.5a, we show a segment of the beam before deformation. So 7.5a you have a segment of the beam and beam as you see is of this general shape as long as it is symmetric about the plane of uh, symmetry. Okay. The area is symmetric, the cross section area. Okay. And uh, we show a segment of beam before deformation, fig figure 7.5p, the deformed trace of the beam in the plane of symmetry is shown. So this is the deformed trace of the plane. Okay. You are now seeing this from this side. So this diagram is actually seeing this from this side. So you will see all this as a plane. And this is only a part of the beam. Please don't see this as this is a whole beam. So it's a part of a beam. This is not the entire beam which you see over here. Okay. Now we want to give in some definitions over here so that we can use this for the remainder of chapter 7 and 8. While cross sections have remained plane, the originally straight line longitudinal, originally straight longitudinal lines have become arcs of circle. So this line is what we are talking about. They have become a circle. Not just this line, any other line also, which was like this, which was straight has become the arc of a circle and so is any other horizontal line has become arc of a circle that is something which we have argued before okay what has happened any line like this has become inclined like this okay and moved sort of in this arc of a circle in the deformed configuration okay so this has happened while others while cross sections have remained plain the originally straight lines uh, originally straight longitudinal lines have become arcs of circle some of these lines have elongated can you see that if you are bending it in this way i mean you can try to bend uh, uh, eraser rubber eraser in this way you will see that I mean try to bend it in this way you will see that so if there is a horizontal line over here it would have become like this okay so this would have shortened in length consider a line over here a horizontal line okay and you can actually draw a line with a pencil on your eraser and see this 
I mean one in the upper half draw a line, one line draw in the lower half and after the formation this would be over here something like this. This would have extended in length and that is what the author says that some of these lines have elongated and some of the lines have shorted in this shortened in this deformation but there is one line in the plane of symmetry which has not changed in length. If you consider this line which is exactly passing through this centroid that is called the neutral axis that line does not change in length. Yes, it does curve. Okay, it does take up the form of arc of a circle but that line does not change in length. Okay, and this is again something which you can easily visualize in by drawing a line on an eraser. Okay, draw a sharp line equally measured. Draw one in the upper half, one in the lower half and then you will see what I mean by what this line being shortened, this line being extended and this line remains the same. One of the things is that we do not, ex I mean for an eraser it's a general problem, it's an easy problem because the geometry is well defined. But let's say for a complicated geometry we don't know its precise location. Okay, But let's call this line as the neutral axis. This line which does not A line on this axis after deformation does not change in length so this is called the neutral axis okay so in many cases it may be passing through the centroid but the actual definition of what a neutral axis is this that if you draw a line on that axis not along that axis on that axis that line will not change in length during pure bending okay now, since this seems to be a very important line, let's set up our coordinate system in the undeformed beam so that the x-axis coincides with the neutral axis. Okay, this seems a good place for your origin. So, put your origin on this uh, line and align the x-axis along the neutral axis. And, okay. Now, the xy plane is the plane of symmetry x y is the plane of the symmetry it's already shown in the figure but i'm just drawing which we had already seen this and this was exactly the plane of the symmetry which you were seeing over here okay what you were doing is you were trying to look it from this side so if you try to look at the x y plane from this side or this plane of symmetry from this side you will see it as a line like this okay Fine, let's so that part is defined. Now, although we admit that there may be, and then there is this xy plane is a plane of symmetry, and the xz plane is a neutral surface. So, this xz is the neutral surface. So neutral axis, plane of symmetry and neutral surface. There are three things which we have learned. One, two and three. And if at all you are ever asked to show the these planes in the uh, diagram, please don't draw a rectangular beam and show this. Please don't do this. Please draw a plane, a cross section which is like this or any cross section which you like, which is general and symmetric in the way which we want it to be. Okay. Please don't draw a circular or a uh, rectangular cases. Yes, it would be valid over there, but those would be specialized cases. They would spoil or uh, sort of degrade the definition of what a neutral axis would be. For example, if you take just a circular uh, sort of a beam, okay, circular cross section beam, the neutral axis would be passing through the axis, which is the central axis of that. So that would make it very easy, the centroid of the circle, the center of the circle. But we want something which is slightly more uh, involved. Okay, so please draw something like this if someone ever asks you 
what would be the planes okay now although we admit that there may be deformation on the cross section in its own plane we make the following assumption we assume that the deformation will be sufficiently small so that we can use the coordinates of a point in the undeformed cross section to provide an adequate approximation to the location of the point after deformation okay that's not very uh, hard to make we make this assumption in the small deformation theory so you assume small deformation of cross section in its own plane what does it mean take out any cross section of this beam and then it would look something like this i guess okay just a just a simple cross section and as we have seen that this cross section can deform as long as plane lines remains plane and so and so but this has to be small so if this was a straight line in this one this can become like this but it has to be small that's all if this was like this then it can become like this but this deformation is small okay so both parts are necessary it can have both the extension or the shear so the both the normal strain and the shear strain for this line element in this plane okay so you have already studied about how uh, normal and shear strains act so that is what we are using over here okay so if after this assumption uh, you are able to use the undeformed coordinate system to provide a good approximation of the other one good approximate means that you can use that as a reference to write the new geometry let's see what it means so if i j and m n which are separated by distance y look at i j this line element and mn is another line element they are separated by this distance uh, y maybe better okay from the neutral axis and they are deformed into concentric circles of arcs this is the arc i1 j1 this is the arc m1 n1 remember mn is lying along the neutral axis okay you assume that the difference between their radii of curvature can still be taken as y so this is the assumption that if y was originally the separation between the two y will continue to be the separation between over here in this curved situation okay now we assume that the difference between their radius of curvature can still be taken as y we use the simple rho for the radius of curvature of deformed neutral axis m1 n1 so rho we will use for m1 n1 the radius of curvature of i1 j is then rho minus y okay so rho minus y now since i j is equal to m n in this one but m n will remain the same as m1 n1 because it is lying along the neutral axis the normal strain can be written as i1 j1 minus m1 n1 divided by m1 sorry i j n1 so you want to use this as your line element and find the normal strain along the x direction that would be i1 j1 minus i j the original length divided by the ij which is original length now i1 j1 minus m1 n1 divided by m1 n1 because ij is equal to m1 n1 now the circular arcs can be expressed in terms of the angle and why we can express in terms of the angle because they were small so m1 n1 is equal to rho into delta pi well actually it does not have to be small now at this stage because this can be written 
for a circular arc even when the angle delta phi is not small okay so in this particular definition i do not think that you have to have a, a delta phi which is uh, small but do check it think about it and let me know if there's anything which is not correct and i1 j1 will be equal to rho minus y by delta phi same logic so this would mean that the shear strain is equal to sorry normal strain is equal to uh, you substitute i1 j1 and m1 n1 in this one and then write it as minus of y by rho is equal to minus of d phi by ds by y so this will give us the distribution of longitudinal strain okay longitudinal meaning normal strain in the plane of symmetry so all this is valid only in this plane of symmetry so i and j lie in this plane i mean as is clearly shown okay and then there is a minus sign which indicates that if you are actually above the neutral axis if you are positive y then the ex will be negative meaning this part will be under compression and this part will be under extension and that happens if you want to bend your eraser okay bend it like this as i have told i mean you can take this one half and then draw one line by pencil draw other line by pencil of the same length you will see that this compresses the reason is that this will now become like this but compress and but this will extend so there is compression in this part and tension in this part and that is shown by this minus sign so this strictly applies to the plane of symmetry sorry okay this strictly applies to the plane of symmetry but we shall assume that uh, this will also apply uh, at all points of the cross section of the beam so assumption is that it applies at all points of in the cross section of the beam not just the plane of symmetry okay so we will later on discuss the validity of this assumption and in addition to this you can using the symmetry you can clearly conclude that the shear strains will all be zero in this case okay i mean you can take up any element and see that it will not not have any rotation so you are equally free to do that okay so you will find that and because of the symmetry you will not see please make this argument to yourself that why would the shear strain be zero what you do you please look up what shear strain is okay draw those two line elements remember oc and oe you would you would you should know where to draw these two line elements in what plane and then argue that they will actually be zero because there will not be any change in the angle so please do that okay so we'll continue in the next class further on thank you